<clears throat> going to um, just clear everything. And uh, just remind you that if you would like to um, go to long, that you could do so. Let me just make sure that. Oh, goodness. So um, hold on a moment. Yeah, I don't know. I may have made some sort of mistake. I, what I'll do is I'll drop these into the chat right now in case they're not too big, in case somebody does want to um, code along with me. Sorry about that. I was doing it quickly while I was in a lot of meetings today. So there's the uh, R code I've just dropped in. It should pop up in chat in just a moment. There is the um, data zip. And to follow along, what you'll want to do is um, unzip that to a folder and unzip the contents of the data folder to the same folder. And uh, all you should have to do is to set your working directory. And you'll be good to go. I'm just going to pause for a minute for people to do that in case they want to do that. Um, maybe uh, I'll just I'll start in about 30 seconds, and if anybody needs a little more time, just just indicate in the chat, and I'll I'll slow down as I start. <laughs> now, um, if if you want to um, <clears throat> if you want to take on board GIS skills in R, um, and you want to build up in the next few meetings, I view this chapter, chapter two, uh, as one of the most important ones to spend some quality time with. It's a long chapter, um, but it's very important. And it, it, it literally, if I were to think of one place uh, to send people to learn about the structure of, of uh, spatial data objects, and these same spatial data objects, they're not, they're not just specific to R. I hope that's obvious to you. It talks a little bit about this in the, um, in the chapter. But um, they, uh, I can't think of a, of a better, um, shorter introduction where if, if you could engage with this chapter two, that you would end up with more robust knowledge. It's just, it's just such a nice um, terse, but very technically thorough um, resource. And, and it is fairly easy. All the code is relevant. So I'm going to go quite quickly through the code um, so that we can hope to get through it. It's quite a long script, and I want to leave enough time at the end to, uh, to go through the, the um, exercises. <clears throat> so if you want to follow along, um, what I'm going to do is um, bring up the the chapter as well, just so that I can have that ready. Bring up the exercises, and I'll just uh, park that for when we get to the exercises later. And again, um, I've already linked the uh, the GitHub site that has all of the chapters available to you. <clears throat> I I think I may not have done that on on our Herrig page. Okay. So if you want to follow along with the um, this, first thing we need to do is set up by loading these libraries. And you may have to install some of them indeed. I'm just going to make the font a little bigger so you can follow along. I've got a clickable table of contents for this. Most of them align with sections in the book if you want to read along uh, later. Uh, hopefully uh, some of you are able to have a glance at the book before this. I'm just going to load them all up. There'll be a, lots of warnings. There are no warnings because I think I've already suffered all the warnings. This chapter starts off with the real basics of stuff that um, a lot of us know. Not not all of us may know it though. Um, how do you assign a value? We assign it with the assignment operator. We're assigning a new variant value to something called W, and it pops up in our global environment. And we can display the value by submitting the name of the um, the function three two one, and it'll will display the value down in the console down here, three, two, one. So we've assigned three and we get three. But we can use the class function to tell us what kind of variable it is. Um, we don't have that information automatically displayed, but if we mouse over 
some of you may just about be able to see the small text that says numeric and that it takes up 56 bytes. And if we submit um, the class function with the name of the variable 321, we see indeed that it is classed as numeric. Remember my metaphor for what is happening in the, uh, the R universe behind the scenes is uh, the passive aggressive butler. And I use the class function quite a lot when I'm using um, <coughs> libraries that I'm not an expert in that I don't use every day <laughs> just to make sure <clears throat> that I know what the <clears throat> what the butler is doing behind the scenes. You know we can use the um, help shortcut, the question mark in front of the name of a function. This is question mark class 321 and we'll get a help page that will give us examples of the usage of our functions and a little bit of details if we wish to read and down at the bottom, usually some very terse um, example code. OK, so this is just basic stuff. I'm going to start going a little faster. What you may not know is we can just say the name of a variable and get its its actual source code down in the console. Three, two, one. Sometimes this is going to be um, very hard to understand. Um, sometimes if it goes to a, com a compiled object in a different programming language, this isn't going to help us very much. But sometimes, like for standard deviation, the SD function, we will actually get um, the functions here that are behind the scenes for the standard deviation function. We can assign a different class of variable with a, like a character. We use the quotes to do that. The passive aggressive butler has made uh, the object said a um, <clears throat> that now just contains a single value a a um, object of class character for us. So it's correctly guessed on this occasion what we wanted. We can also um, take the class of a function and functions have their own class and it's that of the function. We can um, use the concatenate function, <clears throat> the C function. We use that to uh, combine values uh, into a vector. Here we can see all the code if I do that. So we're combining all of these values. Remember, we've already defined W as three. So got some, uh, the author anyway, has got some uh, complicated math going on here. Let's make this vector three, two, one. Let's see what's in it. Three, two, one. OK, so we've got the calculations coming out. And then finally, we exploit the, um, the slice out values. We can exploit the square brackets function. To look at the address of a value that's in the, the object that we just made, Z. So uh, we have the we've printed it out. We have this index on the side one, five and nine. Those are the addresses one, five and nine, the first, fifth and ninth element of the vector. So if we want to see the sixth element, we might do something like this. Since this is the fifth value, this is the sixth value. So we should expect to see 150 down in the um, console, three, two, one. And this is a way using the concatenate function, we can concatenate the addresses six and eight. And here we should see 150 and three. So three, two, one. And we do, thankfully. All right, we can also remove elements of Z here. Now we're not we're not telling it to actually we're not telling the butler to actually change the vector Z. But instead we're asking it, well, what's inside Z mi minus whatever is at the sixth address? So here we should see minus one uh, 27 and then this long number in a long list of vectors three, two, one. Minus 27 and the long vector, the long number. And here we're using the subtract notation to subtract a range of values 6 through 11. Um, so let's see what we get. 3, 2, 1. We should just get a few values and we do. OK, so what happens if we try to put um, a value in an object that has got uh, one location specified? OK, 3, 2, 1, boom. We get an error, object V not found. Well, look up here, there is no V. So of course that causes an error. Um, but what we could do is we could initialize an object called V. And the way we initialize vectors is with, um, we tell it you know, what kind of vector we want to make. We could use numeric, character, 
we could make a matrix, a vector. Um, here we'll initialize a generic vector of V. Um, keep your eyes up there in the global environment, three, two, one. So now we have a um, numeric vector that's empty. Now we can exploit the, um, the um, uh, notation for the addresses of cell values, and we can assign, if you, if you kind of watch up here, when I execute this code, it's going to create an address at the first location in the vector and put in the value four, and you'll be able to see that reflected up here, three, two, one. And now I'm going to do it for the second and put 6.2 in that, three, two, one. So now we have a numeric. It's got the addresses one and two, and the values are four and 6.2. So this is just manipulating the vector, and finally we can print the whole vector down in the console. Look down the lower left, three, two, one. There we go. Now, um, <clears throat> we don't often do this in R, but we do it all the time in, in Python syntax, where um, when we want something to display in a particular way or, or at all down in the console for output, we use the print function. In Python, that's part of good practice. In R, we don't have to use it, but it, it can be good practice some of the time. So up here, if I make the assignment, if I want to take the contents of what's in the V vector, and I want to assign the contents of that to the Z vector, uh, if I just select just that assignment, I'm not asking anything to be displayed down in the, um, the console at all. So uh, if we watch over here, we can see the Z contents change. Here it comes, three, two, one. It did change, but nothing printed out. But if I if I print that operation assignment, it will come up down in the console, three, two, one. <laughs> so we can exploit that to um, sort of keep an eye on what's going on while we're doing live coding. We're often in regular code that we want to run for an analysis, once we're sure it's working properly, we often wouldn't do that. So we can assign the numbers 1 through 30 to the uh, vector W and um, 30 to 1 using this notation for a sequence of variables with a colon. So we'll just do that down in the um, console, 3, 2, 1. These are the contents of the new W and Z vectors. Um, we can create data in other ways with um, helper functions like the sequence function. So we can read about that with the help. We can print um, a, a matrix that we construct, constructing it with a matrix function. One of the things that is second nature to me, I sometimes forget to, to say that it's actually a good idea to put into con um, practice when you're learning R, is that for a big old um, big old uh, expression like this might look intimidating if you're not used to looking at our code. And I, I don't love the way that this is typed out. Um, this consists of the matrix function, which I'm, uh, every function has an open bracket and a closed bracket. And then it's all wrapped in the print function. So this is a, 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 a function nested inside of another function and the function that's nested assigns its output to a variable. So there's quite a lot going on in here. And a top tip for figuring out stuff like this in any programming language is to run just part of it at a time. You don't have to run it all at once and try to struggle with it. So let's just see what happens with just the matrix function. Here we're providing data, the range of the um, integers one to nine, and we're telling it, listen, I want a matrix and I want exactly three rows. So let's see what happens. Two, one of two things could happen. Let's see which one does. Three, two, one. So that one through nine could be filled by columns. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And it is. Or it could have been filled by rows. There is an argument to be able to manipulate that. But let's print our matrix once we assign it to the number a a will pop up up here and the matrix will be printed out down here you can look in either place three two one there we go now we have uh, data in matrix format we can pull out the first um, now matrices have rows and columns and so do data frames <coughs> rows 
comma, columns. And we can specify here, we're specifying that we want the first row, and by leaving the column space blank, we want all the columns. Three, two, one. So this is the first row of our matrix A. One, four, and seven are the values, and sure enough, that's all we get. And we can multiply um, the contents of that first row and do other mathematical operations to it. Three, two, one. There we go, it all just works. So a final trick that we're shown is the C bind, column bind. We can bind things as columns to make um, structures that have more dimensions than a single vector. So here we're making a vector with three elements, another vector with three elements we're making a different way, W and Z, three, two, one. And now we're binding W and Z, three, two, one, by columns. So this is just really a basic blast in how to use these tools. Spend some quality time for this if this stuff isn't reviewed. Um, now, map tools is one of the fundamental um, packages that um, that uh, this author introduces here, and uh, <clears throat> we can we can see by using this path package underscore dependencies the map tools. What this tells us is a name of other packages that are required to be able to use the uh, package dependencies. And um, in this case, there's quite a lot of them. The stats package is one of the base package, uh, one of the fundamental packages that automatically loads in R. Utils is the same, GR device is the same, Lattice the same, Grid the same. Uh, methods, I think, is also one of the base R packages. Foreign, same, it's also one of the base R packages. But SP is a dependency of this map tools, and we've already encountered that. That's the spatial package. It's a little bit old fashioned now, but it's still the, the bedrock of, um, of all spatial data analysis in R. Um, OK, what else are we doing? We've gone through loops and vectors in a previous one. We did four loops. So let's make, um, here we're saying we're going to make a numeric vector that's empty but has 30 slots. We're going to put that in W so we can watch this change over here. Three, two, one. We're going to change Z as well. Three, two, one. Actually, it didn't make it empty. It made it with zeros. Uh, now we're going to use a for loop to do something. For I in one to 30. So we're going to change the value of I starting at one and then incrementally go up through 30. First, we're going to assign the value of I to the vector place one through 30 for W. Then we're going to start at um, 30 minus i plus 1. So when i is 1, this is kind of a way to think about for loops. When i is 1, we're going to get um, 30 minus 1 plus 1. So we have 30. <laughs> and we're going to put that in the position z i. So what this should do, we have all zeros up here now. You can keep your eye up there. What this should do is increment as the for loop goes. W should go 1 to 30 for the positions 1 to 30, and Z should go 30 to 1 for the positions 1 to 30. Confused yet? Well, keep your eyes up here. 3, 2, 1. Bam. And now let's print W. We get 1 to 30, and let's also print Z. 30 to 1. Thankfully, it did what we wanted it to do. And we can do some other fancy things as well. We can um, say, well, if um, WI is greater than five, so now um, W, uh, the one to five, I mean, we can ask, we can actually just remember that trick of evaluating little bits of bigger pieces of code. What we should get um, when we ask the question, is uh, WI greater than five, we should get, um, the uh, the values for one when i is one to five, we should get false. And right now, what's the value of i? Let's just see. It's thirty. So we should get a true if we submit this three two one. So it's true because um, w i should be thirty. Um, so let's see what this does. Um, so if WI is greater than five, we're going to actually put 20 
into that space and cover it. And otherwise, we're going to put zero into that space. So it's going to be yes or no. If it's yes for each val each of the values in the addresses at W, we're going to get a new value. So let's see what that does. And actually, we're changing the uh, values of double j W just to give it one to ten here. So three, two, one, bam. We do our for loop and let's see what's in W now, three, two, one. <clears throat> so for the values one through five that weren't greater than five, we get in the zero and for everything else, um, we get 20. So uh, this is another way, another little tricky way of doing it. In the interest of time, it's five o'clock now, I'm gonna skip the rest of the code and I'm just gonna do the first couple of the exercises, but there's quite a lot going on in this chapter. We just we just ran out of time for it. It's a little ambitious to try to go through two chapters. So I'm going to go down here to my exercises. And uh, I'm going to bring up the old the book here. Now, if you have two screens at home, you could choose to um, to do this like this. Um, just is probably the way that I would I would do it. And I'm going to do my view as page navigation, page display as enable scrolling, and then I'm going to get my um, tools. Let me say don't want the tools. There we go. I want the little hand and I'm going to I'm going to drag the exercises like this. There we go. Now I hope this is not too small for you to see. But I'm just going to go through a few exercises in the last few minutes while I'm recording here. Now, uh, Venables and Ripley, it says. Let me just um, maybe highlight this. This is the first one that I'm doing. Venables and Ripley are the authors of um, a very famous book. Excuse me one moment. <clears throat> Let me see, there it is. I've got my um, my my background effects on. There we go. Venables and Ripley. There we go. It's a very famous textbook. It's still one of the definitive texts, uh, even if you don't use R. S, of course, being the precursor language to R. <clears throat> it's called Modern Applied Statistics with S. And it's still one of the definitive textbooks for teaching the general linear model or, or indeed for scientists to learn the general linear model. <clears throat> and this author says, you know, Venables and Ripley, this uh, this famous textbook made it make a cogent point. One of the first things to learn about programming, if you're going to do some scientific programming, is how to stop it from running away. And um, so what they instruct you to do is they instruct you to run this code and then just kind of think about what is happening in the code. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to set I 1 to 20. I'm just going to, for this exercise, remove this stuff and make I just the numbers 1 through 20 and say, you know, while I is less than, than 5, I'm going to set I uh, equal to 2. I'm going to assign the value of 2 to I. All right, so let's run this and see what happens. And um, what happens is we're evaluating. Nothing is changing. We can see the little stop button up here right now. We can't do anything in the console. And this the control of operations in computer programming is it's probably one of the things that when you're learning to to uh, uh, do anything in a scripting language, it's one of those concepts that is problematic. So it's just a little exercise. What is happening? Well, um, let's let's hit break. And it says warning. Um, the condition has length um, greater than one and only the first element will be used. And what is happening is it goes to uh, evaluate um, and do something while some condition is true. But because it's a vector, it can it only evaluates the first um condition and uh it 
it here uh, I is always less than five. And so we're we're always just trying to assign a new value to I. And uh, here something funny has happened. I think this is a little bit of a bug that they don't really talk about in the book, but um, I think this is probably uh, something that the passive aggressive Butler has done where uh, we can see we have a variable called I up here in the uh, global environment that sure enough, it tells us that it's a vector with the values um, one to 20. But down here, we can see that our while loop has done its job and has converted the value of I to the single value of two, which then when it reevaluates, while I is less than five will infinitely stay there. I think this is one of the gentlest um, set of exercises I can think of. Um, I'm going to go down to one of the spatial ones because we didn't get to those in the um, going through the chapter code, but I, I guess I would encourage you to uh, to use the template script. I'll, I'll update it right after our meeting today to uh, go through this yourself if you're interested in using R as a GIS or, or indeed even using a regular GIS just to learn about the spatial data structures. Let's just um, let's just pick one. Let's pick this last one because I thought this was kind of cool and it's it's the kind of thing that I've been um, thinking about doing uh, myself for uh, delineating the field margins here at Harper, which no GIS uh, assets that can be shared and analyzed um, apparently exist, which is a little surprising. But uh, let's see what we've got. So uh, let's read the question. I'm going to just highlight this. <clears throat> now it says um, field one of data set four has a trapezoidal shape. So this is a data object that has um, those, uh, those polygon um, points and edges uh, to make uh, the shape. <clears throat> now the coordinate reference system here is one called UTM. The UTM coordinates of the western, southern, and northern boundaries are approximately these northings and eastings. Um, the easting at the northern boundary is this, and the southern boundary is this. Create an SF polygon object. This is a um, spatial features polygon object that we talked about with um, Herman last time he, he told us what SF stands for, and it's one of the modern popular libraries in R, as we learned in this chapter, um, describing the boundary of the field and save it as an Esri shape file named what they tell us to name. Now, this is literally from scratch, creating a polygon that has a real world location and the Esri part, as um, we learned in the chapter, and some of you may know this already, but uh, Esri is the company that is responsible for ArcGIS, the world's most popular GIS program. Um, and, and also Esri have gone a lot of ways to creating the standards for data. So whether or not we use open systems, and, and their standard is open, their standard is completely open, and it's, it's partly led to the success of ArcGIS. So uh, what they say is they've given us some vertices and some boundaries. And um, what we're just going to do is to create some some placeholder objects. There are other ways to do this, but this is a nice little way to do it. Three, two, one. We're going to create a matrix that is comprised of the vertices defined by the values of the objects we just created. And we're creating um, a couple of points on the western boundary, a couple of points on the north, south, and the northeast and southeast. And uh, we're making this in two columns. And remember, it populates by column. So uh, we're just making these into a matrix with a chords mat. And if we want to print this out at the same time, we can do so in print three, two, one. So now we've got our matrix with our coordinate values. We would load up, we would have to load up the library SF. And um, we have, uh, is somebody putting something in the chat? No problem, see ya. 
Um, we're going to make a list out of that. That's the structure of Esri, as we learned in the chapter. We're going to um, <clears throat> list object to convert our matrix into a list and put that into an object coordinates list. That'll pop up up here, three, two, one. It's just a list of one, which we can see in it, and it's got the um, the um, five rows and two columns of data, but it's classed as a list. And then finally, we're going to um, use the STSFC to specify the, the coordinates that are in our list object. And this is, of course, you know, we can bring up the help, read about it, but you would have done that um, during the chapter where he, he talks a little bit about the um, the uh, simple features uh, helper functions uh, here. So we're going to use that to create um, coordinates for a polygon from our list of values. So we're going to do that, and that'll pop up up here as well. Three, two, one. And that took just that actually took a second, which is a little funny to me. Um, and then we are going to assign um, the values for a Z axis to um, to uh, or to to the feature associated with the polygon we've made. It's that metadata feature that will be associated with it just to give it a value. So um, we're just going to give it a name and um, use the um, spatial feature function to convert our value to the coordinates object that we just created up here. So three, two, one. And um, this, if we look back over here at uh, the instruction. <clears throat> two, six, I don't want to run two over here. Let's see what is in there right now. Three, two, one. Ah, it's the it's the reference of the that's right. It's the we I remember now in the chapter he goes through the indices for coordinates reference systems, and now we're setting this to the UTC universal um, coordinates reference system with nor northings and eastings. We do lo loads of examples in the chapter three, two, one. Now, if we pull out the coordinates reference system of our object, it'll list by the index we assigned the uh, UTM um, coordinate reference system. And then we will just uh, we will just plot it. And that, that's a little bit of a boring plot after that work, but it's actually quite amazing that it's very easy to create polygons. And all you would have to do for a study site, a field or whatever is to do the work to construct the polygons and make the shape file just once. And uh, you can just build it up like that. Of course, you can do it in other ways, uh, and there are ways to automate it these days, but it's kind of nice to to figure out how it works. Um, and then we can we won't do it here, but we can actually write this. There were some other exercises and examples in the book, but we can write this to our own um, directory. So we save and curate these assets. Now, that was a um, real firebrand of a of a walk through these chapters. Um, Finn, you're off the hook for next week. Herman, I hope we'll catch up with this. So I'm going to go ahead and um, stop this recording.